Welcome to week two of APH 501. This week we're going to explore spatial thinking from three different perspectives. We'll look at how the topic is understood by psychologists, neuroscientists, and geographers. The geographical perspective is the most important one for us, but knowing how it is connected with these other perspectives gives us insights for teaching and learning geography. We'll begin with a psychological perspective. The educational psychologist Howard Gardner first published his theories on multiple intelligences in 1983. You're probably familiar with the basics of his ideas, that people have particular strengths in these different categories. It doesn't mean that someone is only one of these or the other, and Dr. Gardner has been careful over the years to discourage that type of interpretation of his ideas. One of his categories is the visual-spatial one, and his definitions of what he meant by that often refer to accurate mental visualization and mental transformation of images. Psychologists study people's abilities to do those mental transformations, usually by measuring how accurately and how quickly people can conduct simple spatial tasks, like a test of mental rotation. Recently, a group of psychologists conducted a large overview study of these types of spatial skills, a meta-analysis looking at many hundreds of studies that had been done previously. David Utah, who teaches at Northwestern University, was the lead researcher on this recent effort. After they considered hundreds of studies that, they had, that had been completed, they divided up all of the spatial skills we perform into five distinct categories, disembedding, spatial visualization, mental rotation, spatial perception, and perspective taking. Disembedding means seeing and identifying objects or spatial patterns amidst distracting background information. Here's an example of a hidden patterns test. There is one shape, the model in the upper right, and you're to look carefully at all of the figures below it and see which ones contain somehow that same model shape within it. Researchers often look to see if men or women perform differently on spatial skills tests. With the skill of disembedding, they usually do not find consistent differences between how men and women or boys and girls perform, for example. This kind of test is equally difficult for all of us. Spatial visualization means combining objects into more complex configurations or envisioning objects as you're mentally transforming them. This often requires that we imagine movement between 2D and 3D. In a paper folding and cutting task, you're shown how a piece of paper is folded multiple times, then one part is cut off. You're to match what you expect it would look like after unfolding it in the end, given that prior combination of folding and cutting. Or, you're shown a 3D cube and a cube that's unfolded, and need to determine whether that 3D cube could be created by folding the flat 2D version. Mental rotation is often considered the iconic spatial task. It is certainly the most studied. There are variations as to how the task is conducted, but a classic version is to compare blocks before and after some amount or type of rotation and see which ones are the same. Mental rotation is one of the skills that usually shows differences between men and women. In one study, researchers concluded that sex differences are detected as soon as mental rotation can be measured. What that means is that as soon as children are old enough to take some kind of mental rotation tests, boys and girls perform differently. This means that even babies and toddlers have been shown to have differences, though it's obviously challenging to design a rotation test that a baby can actually take and whose results we can trust. But in general, and across all ages, Boys and men are faster at rotating objects in their minds than girls and women. But here's some commentary on that. Slower response times by many women reflects test caution and double checking of answers. That means that we, women, often hesitate just for a fraction of a second before we click on an answer. So our slower response time is not only because we are finding the test question itself too challenging to answer, but that we don't answer as impulsively, for whatever reason, and maybe we aren't guessing. Also, researchers have found that when they remove the timing pressure of the test, men and women are more likely to perform equally, 
when the test is timed, like when we have only 30 seconds to produce the answer, women do more poorly than men. When the test is untimed, the responses are much closer and sometimes equal. That goes back to test anxiety that varies between men and women. Women tend to have extra high test anxiety around spatial tests, and that affects our performance measures too. Spatial perception means being able to understand and use spatial principles, such as horizontal and vertical invariance, or how things change or stay the same when they're rotated around a horizontal or vertical axis. With the water level test, someone has to imagine that these tilted bottles are partially filled with water, and they're to draw where the upper surface of the water line would be. The same principle applies to a truck on a hill, or two abstract objects, such as a rod or a stick within a frame. Gender differences can be measured in tests of spatial perception as well. These have been shown with participants as young as eight years old and favor males. The differences grow stronger with age, becoming statistically significant with adults. So, in general, and as measured by testing and with samples of a population, men perform more quickly and accurately than women on tests of vertical and horizontal axes. Finally, perspective taking means being able to visualize an entire environment from a different perspective. A famous example came from Jean Piaget, described in his 1967 book, A Child's Conception of Space. It is called the Three Mountains Task, and it was conducted by having a child stand on one side of a table on which there were three mountains of different heights, and on top of each mountain was a small item or object, like a little house. The child was asked to imagine that if a doll were located on other sides of the table, what would the doll be able to see? Could the child perceive that from some perspectives the taller mountains would hide the visibility of the shorter mountains and therefore the objects on them? So if this compilation of tasks themselves seems abstract, it is. Do they seem abstract to you? Do you think that you're particularly good or bad at any of these? Do you think these have any connection to your own lives, your own day-to-day -day experiences? Let's consider some examples. Disembedding means perceiving objects, paths, or spatial configurations amidst distracting background information. That's exactly what we're doing when we play Where's Waldo, or when we try to find items that are designed to be hidden like by camouflage. With disembedding, we can train our brains to look for patterns that don't belong, to look for flaws or irregularities, whether it's on a production line looking at quality control matters, or looking at medical images, or when a geologist discerns specific structures from mapped representations. While all of these tasks fall under the category of disembedding, and we can become experts at one or the other, it doesn't mean that those skills necessarily transfer. So the expert radiologist wouldn't necessarily be automatically an expert at finding Waldo, nor would the Waldo expert be good at looking at medical images. How and when these types of skills do transfer is something that researchers continue to investigate. Assembling items like furniture from Ikea using diagrams like this one necessarily involves spatial visualization and mental rotation. For example, for us to envision how this peg at the bottom of the side piece connects the sides to the base of the furniture piece, we've had to mentally turn the base of the furniture piece and imagine the hole that the wooden peg would fit into, even though we can't see it at all from this angle. Some of you may know that you love to open up the IKEA boxes and dive right into following along with their diagrams. Or maybe you're so good at it that you don't bother with the instructions at all and there are likely others of you who already know you dread the chore. And the ability to put your Netflix DVD in its cover into the mailing envelope so that the barcode is correctly showing up a little window involves mental rotation and spatial visualization. Spatial visualization means we can envision how to transform objects into more compl complex configurations knowing how to cut folded paper so that it's transformed into a comp particular complex pattern, such as a snowflake you've designed, is, is an example of this mental skill. 
Spatial perception means we can apply an abstract spatial principle such as horizontality. Geologists rely on this to follow linear patterns of rock formations, and hanging a picture on a wall so that it's straight also applies. Some people can't stand seeing a framed picture tilting a bit, and they rush to adjust it, while others don't seem to notice at all. Some psychologists believe these principles of horizontality and verticality are developed as we become upright when we learn to walk, and our own primary axis of our body from our feet to our heads is a vertical one. Lastly, perspective taking means being able to visualize an environment in its entirety from a different position. For example, here is a parking sign in Seattle, Washington. Especially for those of us not from Seattle, it might take significant perspective taking to know how to follow the directions of this sign. You might have to stand back and imagine where you are within an overall map of Seattle and think about which direction Puget Sound was and if you know that Puget Sound is west of the city, whatever side of this sign went towards the water must be the west side and that's where you could not park. Of course, if you know the city really well, that sense of direction begins to happen much faster and intuitively. So the mental steps may happen almost instantaneously and would not have to be so deliberate. For others, that external frame of reference of knowing where west or north is from wherever you might be at that moment is a challenge. Visualizing environments from different positions doesn't happen only in geographic space. For a, mo for a more local frame of reference, think of how we arrange items from larger to smaller in the refrigerator. It involves perspective taking to know that when you put the small yogurts behind the cases of soda, no one will be able to easily see them. It's really just like Piaget's Three Mountains task. So sometimes we deliberately arrange items to facilitate viewing with the small items in front. And sometimes we deliberately do the opposite, like hiding the last small container of leftover Thanksgiving stuffing behind the gallon of milk and a big head of cabbage so that it remains obscured from the eager eyes of others in your household. One experience that we've all had which involves both perspective taking and mental rotation is the use of you are here maps. By their nature, these maps cannot easily be physically manipulated or rotated because they're mounted or placed somewhere in a fixed position. That is, until we can all carry around one of Harry Potter's marauder maps. But until then, with these fixed maps, one is forced to mentally transform and reconcile their visual input from the world around them with the mapped representation situated in front of them. This task is challenging to many, and some cartographers and map designers are beginning to learn from spatial cognition research about how to make the map as effective and helpful as possible. This can include modifying its orientation and making certain choices about symbology. So these are five different types of spatial cognition skills or abilities. Our abilities to do these types of skills well influence what, influences what types of careers we choose. Researchers compare the current occupations of people in their 30s to the scores they received on spatial tests in high school. Many who are now in STEM professions and the performing and visual arts tended to have scored well on spatial tests. They also found that educators and lawyers tested lower than average on spatial skills when they had been in high school. In summary, many men usually do better than many women on some of these spatial tests. Some people of both gender always do well, and some people of both genders always do poorly. These particular patterns have been well established. We also know that there is a relationship between the performance on tests of spatial skills and the eventual choice of careers. At this point in the research, the more interesting question is, so what? We don't need more headlines that say that men are better at spatial thinking than women because A, that's not true, and B, that's not helpful. What's more important is looking at how we can all improve in our spatial thinking abilities. If we set out to improve people's spatial skills, what works and what doesn't? Here's an important conclusionary statement from the recent Utah report. Our results clearly indicate that spatial skills are highly malleable. Even a small amount of training 
can improve spatial reasoning in both males and females and children and adults. Moreover, our results suggest that people may not encounter in their everyday lives experiences that are sufficient to maximize their levels of potential for spatial skills. So, these skills can be improved, but often not by doing things that we might normally find ourselves doing in our everyday lives, whether, we're children, whether we are children in today's structured and test-oriented classrooms or as adults. Games can make a difference. In one study, college students had to play one hour of Tetris a week for 12 consecutive weeks. This is the type of training that some of these psychologists study. The researchers administered a mental rotation test before people began and grouped everyone into a high spatial or a low spatial group, and then they made note of their gender. Then they gave them the same test 12 weeks later. There weren't enough men in the study who scored low to begin with, so that group is absent from the graph of results I show here. The results show us that all of the groups did better, but after one hour a week of Tetris, the group that improved the most compared to their starting place were the women who began with low skills of mental rotation. Their final scores were higher than the original group of high spatial skilled men. Research like this leads us to conclude that girls and women would benefit greatly from attention being paid to their spatial thinking skills. Tetris isn't the only, isn't the most popular game out there, but researchers are seeing similar results from more commonly played games like first-person shooter ones. Let's look at the results more closely and I'll decipher this graph for you. To keep it simple, I'll focus on the women's results and just focus on the mental rotation task, the lower half of the graph. Players took a pretest, then had training, which consisted of 10 hours of playing video games over a four-week period, and then they were tested again. They also took the same mental rotation test five months later. What we see here is that the action game had higher results for women than the non-action and that even after five months, their performance on this kind of rotation test was better than it had been to start. These two examples of video game playing is part of what the Utah group was referring to by training. Now most people do not play hours a week of video games, whether they're shooter games or not. No one is advocating that we try to add five hours of gaming to our school curriculum. Really, the summary statement here is that spatial skills can be improved, but the activities shown to improve them are not likely to be everyday ones. So we should be more aware of this and seek out other and additional opportunities to see what can become part of an everyday experience for a child, to have as strong a set of spatial skills as they might be able to develop otherwise. How much time do you want to spend working on these skills? Well, it depends in part on how critical this type of spatial thinking is to your everyday life. When Cheryl Sorby, an engineer, was working at Michigan Technological University, she led the design of a short course focusing on, on improving the skills of entering students. You simply cannot be a successful engineer if you struggle with the types of spatial cognition skills that we've been discussing here, things like visualization and rotation. So they designed a six week long class that students could take during their first semester of an engineering program, exercises that they spent about 30 minutes a day on. Many young women end up taking this class and it's made significant differences in their abilities to succeed in the program. Other engineering schools have now, been adopted, have now adopted the program and it's becoming better known. These books themselves can be purchased by individuals and the program followed by anyone who wants. The books themselves are filled with page after page of exercises that look like this. Practice makes perfect if you're committed enough to improve your skills. Back to the Utah study. This graph shows the summary results from all of combined studies that their meta-analysis looked at. When you do interventions like, paying, like playing Tetris or other video games or systematically practicing some of the skills, improvement happens. The effect size is a measurement of how much people's skills had improved after the treatments. The largest effect in this graph is for, is for spatial perception, 
and the smallest is for disembedding, perhaps because learning to find Waldo doesn't really help you to identify problems in medical x-rays, as we said earlier. Another important conclusion the meta-analysis showed us is that these effects are durable, as many of the studies tested the subjects again after many months. And these results were found for both sexes and all ages. Looking at spatial cognition is one dimension of spatial thinking. This may seem different to what a geographer would do, but the connections will become more clear soon. Now let's look at some ideas of how spatial thinking and neuroscience are connected. Psychologists look at our patterns of behaviors at what and how of the what and the how of how we act. Neuroscience tries to explain a little of the why, at least from our brain's perspective. A deep understanding of brain functioning is beyond what this course is about and beyond what this instructor can explain. But we're going to take a look at, at a way that one geographer has devoted the last 15 years of his life to studying the connections between our brains, spatial thinking, and geography education. Some of you in this class might have had a chance to hear Phil Gershmael speak about his research. He's a very well-known geography educator, and he and his wife, Carol Gershmael, who's also a geographer, often lead professional development workshops for teachers around the world. Phil's book on teaching geography is a book that all instructors of geography should be familiar with. Phil's presentations almost always include this slide. It reminds us of the story of poor Phineas Gage, who was a Vermont railroad worker. In 1848, following an explosion at his work site, an iron bar penetrated through Phineas's skull and passed through the frontal lobes of his brain, and his ability to function in some ways were severely affected. He became widely studied by doctors at Harvard and elsewhere, and his case was typical of how we learned about the brain at that time. We had to study people who had been injured by wars or by accidents and evaluate what they now could not do that they had been able to do before. As Phil says, it was a very crude and inefficient strategy. Now what neuroscience can rely on, thankfully, is technologies such as PET scans and fMRIs, or functional magnetic resonance imaging. These have been available to researchers for the last 10 to 15 years, and now we can have people perform spatial tasks, for example, looking at images of blocks to rotate, while they're undergoing an fMRI. Where the brain's images light up or activate on the scans are the areas that are working and engaged. Phil Gershmael has devoted himself to understanding how spatial thinking is understood by neuroscience and how that affects geography teaching and learning. So he has read and synthesized over 3,000 articles in the last 15 plus years and attended conferences and visited researchers and thought about these ideas a lot. At the end of the day, his multi-year summary of the neuroscience research suggests that our brains engage in at least three different modes or types of spatial thinking. Comparisons, making associations, finding patterns, making analogies, identifying hierarchies, observing transitions, noting regions, and detecting auras. He goes on to conclude that within the past 15 years, neuroscience, neuroscientists seem to have concluded that different modes of spatial thinking use distinctly different brain networks. Moreover, different, these different modes of spatial reasoning are not correlated. Different people do different kinds of spatial thinking with different levels of skill and they develop at different rates. So people's ability to use correlations or analogies or understand transitions all varies. Phil Gershmael, Dr. Gershmael is also passionate about educational policy. As we begin the use of common core state standards for writing and math, he warns that there has been no attention paid to how spatial thinking approaches are highly important in the learning process overall. It's not that spatial ideas still don't exist behind the content of the standards. The ideas are there, but they're in no way identified or highlighted or acknowledged, 
and the organization of the content in sequences across grade levels has ignored this knowledge too. This will affect the design of educational materials, professional development, and evaluation and assessment. So that's a little about neuroscience and spatial thinking. It isn't brain-based learning, but we do now have insights into how we are hardwired to think spatially in different ways. If this interests you, look for opportunities to take a professional development workshop with Dr. Gershmael. The final perspective on spatial thinking we will begin today is that from geographers themselves. Gollage and Stimson were geographers who divided up spatial ability into three different dimensions. Spatial visualization and orientation will seem very similar to the ways that psychologists think about space. The ability to mentally manipulate, rotate, twist, or invert different visual stimuli, or the comprehension of the arrangement of elements within a visual pattern. The final perspective, um, I'm sorry, it is their third category, spatial relations, that is of particular interest to geographers. Spatial relations are the abilities to recognize spatial distributions and spatial patterns, to connect locations, to associate and correlate spatially distributed phenomena, to comprehend and use spatial hierarchies, to regionalize, to orient to real-world frames of reference, to imagine maps from verbal descriptions, to sketch maps, to compare maps, to overlay and dissolve maps. Specifically, there are ideas and abilities here that are part of the skills and ways of thinking that geographers practice. These are also the skills, practices, and habits of mind that spatially literate people have. As we begin to study spatial relations, it's important to understand how scale and context affect the ways we think in and about space. There are different types of space that researchers use. Psychologists often administer their simple psychometric tests in abstract space. These blocks or other items are just drawings, and we have no notion of scale or context with them. They're just abstract objects. Other tests are done with objects or items that really do exist, like blocks or clay, and since the tests are often done on tables, they're referred to as taking place in tabletop space. But the items themselves may still be fairly abstract, and they're not typically things that have any context around them, which makes scale difficult. Researchers may deliberately choose to conduct tests in abstract or table space because it reduces the confusion around you, removing distractions that may affect their ability to measure only your performance on the test itself. It's like taking the test within a vacuum, so only your response to the test itself can be measured. But life doesn't really happen in a vacuum. In the real world, we are always using our different senses in the landscape around us to gain cues about our spatial situation. Trying to test for spatial knowledge within these settings is more complicated, and a researcher would have less confidence that they're able to single out spatial skills the way that they do with those other psychometric tests. But it is this reality that geographic researchers would like to know more about. This matters, this matters because we've already learned through testing situations that some spatial tests, tasks, like mental rotation, for example, within geographic space and abstract space and tabletop space are not the same. All of the environmental cues that actually contribute to our knowledge and decisions in the real world are absent in most psychometric studies. However, being proficient at spatial skills within abstract space can be highly important for engineers, architects, and mechanics, for example, whose livelihoods are dependent on those tasks. Regardless of the space where these tasks are taking place, we'd all like to think that we could perform them as accurately and as quickly as possible. The components of spatial relations, as the idea was coined by Gollage and Stimson, underlie how geographers think about and perceive the world. There are many spatial concepts embedded in this description, including distributions, patterns, regions, locations, etc. 
In the next few weeks, we will see how these ideas inform our understanding of human geography. If you want to follow up on any of this research, here are some pages of citations.